Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Alan. If you're tuning in for the first time, come on in and make yourself at home. To all you returning enlightened investors, I am delighted to be back with you again today. We have a value bomb of investment insights. With us is an investor who has invested in over 6,000 apartment units, over 15 years of real estate investing experience. His investment scope, though, reaches far beyond real estate. He and his wife are Tony nominated producers to their production and investment credit are Hamilton and the International Tour of Wicked. Currently in production is Moulin Rouge and American Utopia. I am thrilled and excited to have with us today, Matt Pench, and I can't pronounce his name. So Matt, I, I did just before getting on to this, I pronounced it correctly. Matt Cheney. Matt Pacheni. Pacheni. Welcome to the show. Matt, let's start off by sharing an experience from your formative years that helped you to be the person you are today. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. It's a pleasure to be on the show. A a thing from my formative years, I, I think about one of the things that, that happened to me several times was I found that persistence was a really good trait. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example on that which is that when I was younger, I went with my sister. I used to live in Florida in the Orlando area. And I went with my sister to an audition for Disney World. We lived not too far from Disney World. And they would hire uh, younger kids to perform in front of the castle for the holiday times, like around Christmas time. And my sister was in a dance school and all of her friends, they, it was like a big deal. They all wanted to go to that. And I had been taking a little bit of dance class myself. And I decided to just go along for the ride. I The callbacks happened and I, I got a call back. She didn't. And a lot of people told me before the callback, they said, they really want people at Disney who smile. It's like really important smile. So I'm sitting there the entire day with an ear to ear grin. Whether I was up you know, doing a performance or I was just sitting in the crowd, any time anybody from Disney looked at me, I was there with this big smile. And my face, my cheeks were like sore that night because I had been smiling so much. It turns out I ended up getting the show, which was fantastic. We were in rehearsals for the show and my father spoke with the director one day and came back to me that, that evening while we were driving home and he told me the story about the conversation he had. He said that when he was talking with the director, told him, that I was talented and I was good. I made it into sort of the final round there at the callback. So I had the chops to do the show. But every time they looked at me, all they saw was this ear to ear grin. And they thought, wow, this kid, he must want this so bad. Like he's just smiling all day long. We have to give it to him. He would be crushed if he didn't get it. We know if we gave it to him, he would work so hard. And that's why I got, that's why I got the part. Again, I was able to still do it. But that persistence of constantly smiling, and this has happened to me a few other times in my life too, just through other, not just my charming smile, but through other things where I've been very persistent and that's really allowed me to succeed. Fascinating uh, story. <laughs> you do have a nice smile, so I can see why it gets Thanks. you a long way in life. You've done a lot of non-traditional things in your life, particularly starting out as an actor. You were a professional actor before you got into real estate investing and before you got into Broadway production. So talk to us about this non-traditional background, how you came to get into that background, how you found your way into real estate. Yeah, I'll try to nutshell it. I've actually written a book that'll come out in a few months, and it, that actually details the entire saga with all the, the intricacies. But for me, growing up, I was just something that I, I think my first performance was playing a bird in a preschool show. It was just like a thing I did. Everyone was in it, and, and I liked it. And I just started doing more. I started in, in school, and then and there was fifth grade. I was I was Bert in Mary Poppins, and and I just kind of just kept going from there. I kept doing different shows and having good parts, and I really loved it. I really enjoyed singing mainly. Uh, I liked acting. I, I I did some dancing. I, I I was decent on my feet, but that wasn't really what my passion was more in the the singing and the acting part of things. And yeah, you know, I really enjoyed it. And growing up, doing more and more, doing it in high school, and then I went to 
musical theater conservatory in New York City for college to, to do that. And I, I was a professional actor for five years. I performed in productions all around the country. I was in 15 professional productions as an actor. What happened for me was I started tinkering around with computers on the side. So I used to wait tables in between acting gigs. And, and I started, the internet was really coming of age. Okay, we're talking about the mid to late 90s now, 96, 97. And the internet was really uh, becoming a thing. And I started tinkering around with it uh, as a hobby and ended up becoming something that I could do in between acting gigs. And then it actually became something that I grew a passion for and started doing that more and more. As an actor, a lot of people who did it professionally would try to discourage me, I think in a kind way, but just let me know the realities of, hey, listen, it's a really tough business. Some of the most talented people can't even make a consistent living doing it unless you're like super lucky, you get the right show at the right time, you get them on a TV show or a movie. But there's just so many talented people. And, I, and I've seen now later in life that that's very true. Some of the most talented people I know never had a you know, successful career in it. This was something that I started doing that I wasn't consciously not going to be an actor anymore. It's just something I started doing on the side and was passionate about and enjoyed doing and started doing more and more of that. Like I said, this was during the, the heydays of the dot coms. So I actually had an opportunity. There was so much work coming to me. I was working as a freelance type person that I was able to actually start my own company. So I started my own boutique agency and I had my own boutique agency in New York City for about five years. And then the dot com bubble burst and I went in house showtime the cable television channel, they were a client of mine. So they offered me a job in-house. I went in-house and was there. And from there, I went into sort of the advertising world. And, and I worked for 18 years in sort of corporate America, working at different agencies, climbing the ranks. And I was a project manager at all those different places. That was my role. I'm, I'm a PMI certified project management professional. And so I was in charge of making sure things got done on time, on budget and at the highest quality possible. While that was going on for the last 10 years of that period of my life, I started investing in real estate as a hobby on the side. And eventually over time, it became something that I also grew a, a passion for that. And my wife got approached with a really cool uh, opportunity completely out of the blue, but it was in Miami, Florida, and we lived in New York City. So we left New York and we moved to Miami. And that's the time that I made the transition. And I just told you in a very short period of time, a very long story, but that's essentially the nutshell version. So when we moved to Miami, that's when I moved into doing real estate full time. And you know, I found that for, for me, what fit really well for me and my skill set and my desire to scale the business was getting involved in multifamily. And so I do multifamily syndications. And that's my primary job. And that's my job. That's my that's what I do full time. You did mention earlier, my wife and I will from time to time join forces. I have the, the previous theatrical background, but that's what she does. That's her sort of W2 nine to five job. It's actually more more like night. She works a lot of nights because she's in the theater, but that's what she does. And we'll join forces and we've worked on a, a, a few different theatrical investments together. But that's something that we do. We really love doing about it, but it's also extremely risky. So it's the kind of thing that we only do once every few years when it's the right thing, when all the moons align. My primary day to day is in the real estate world. Enlightened investors will be right back after this important announcement. I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. So to leave a review, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either platform, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once found, please leave a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to our show's success, so please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It is free to subscribe, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Let's go back to those hobby days in real estate. What were you doing in New York in the real estate industry? Sure. It started for me with being kicked out of the place I was living in. I was living in the generosity of a relative of mine, actually. And it started when I was a poor, starving actor. And I really was. I, mean, I think I quoted in the book, but I, there was a year, the year that I moved in there, I made less than $8,000 that year. And so, 
he owned a place, but he had these maintenance payments that he had to pay. So I took over the maintenance payments. So great deal for me, great deal for him, win-win all around. I moved into that place and then I started my company over time. And then I was outgrowing it anyhow, but he needed to sell a dot-com bubble had burst. And he's, I need you to, I need to sell the apartment. I need you to move out. You got 90 days. So I needed to find a place to live. And what I, I ended up doing was I ended up buying a place. I had a, a little bit of capital, not a lot. And New York City, you might think the prices are very expensive, but the, per- the place I purchased was up in Washington Heights. So all the way at the upper end of uh, Manhattan and was able to get something at a decent price where I had enough money for the down payment. I purchased the property and within a little over two years, I more than quadrupled my initial investment. And that's when through a light bulb, not, yeah, yeah, through appreciation. And, and that's when a light bulb went off in my head. <laughs> Whoa, this real estate thing, this is really powerful. Now, I'd always known, and my dad at one point had been in residential real estate. So I understood real estate to a certain extent at a very high level, but this was my own money <laughs> quadrupling, was quite eye opening. So I used the proceeds from that actually to buy a place on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is a more desirable place. Instead of taking 45 minutes to get to work, now it would only take me 15. (laughs) It's a lot better for me. But I said, wow, I need to start doing more real estate. So the the next thing I ended up doing was I, I invested in, I bought a piece of land up in Connecticut. And again, that's a whole other chapter in my book, but but I, I ended up buying a piece of land and that was an investment that I made and eventually built a house on that land. I designed and built a house, not myself with hammers and nails, but I hired a contractor that I worked with. We built the house. And then once the house was done, I started renting it out first because I had a necessity for, to cover the costs that were expensive. It was a way for me to what I thought was going to be subsidizing a vacation home for me. This was a house up in uh, a lakefront community. The property was not lakeside. It was a, a few lots away, but but still good. And I had a boat and access and everything like that, which was really cool because I lived in the middle of Manhattan. It was nice to have a place to get away to. What ended up happening though, was I rented it and then more people wanted to rent it and more people wanted to rent it. And at that time, I also was a time when I met my wife. And so her parents have a place up in Connecticut that we could go to and utilize. And I just, the, the house, although it wasn't the initial intention, it always was used as a full-time rental place. And that's where I really cut my teeth and learned about property management and how to keep books and things like depreciation, which I didn't really know what they were or how it worked. And that you can do cost segregation, accelerates different types of depreciation. I learned a ton of stuff. The biggest thing that I learned was that I didn't want to manage my properties, especially not short-term rentals. I've not been involved in in a vacation rental type of project since, although I think they're great and that people can make a lot of money from it. It's just not my cup of tea. And project management is not my cup of tea either. There's a lot of work that project, sorry, that property managers have to do with the properties. So I will manage my assets. I will basically oversee what the property management team is doing, which is what I did when I was doing project management. As I rode through the ranks in the advertising world, I became a director level and a group director, and head of a department, and I would oversee project managers and those project managers would be overseeing actual projects. So now I oversee property managers who are overseeing properties. So I use a lot of the skills that I have in motivating people and making sure things are getting done time in a timely fashion and within budget. I use all the, a lot of the same tools and tricks from uh, my 18 years of doing that professionally in New York City onto the real estate world that I'm involved in today. Just a few more questions on filling sure. us in on the details. On this first property you purchased, which tripled in value within, I think you said, two to three years uh, period of time? Yeah, a little uh, over two years it quadrupled. Then you went to another property from that. Did you refinance that property or did you sell out that property? Sold the property. Okay. Yeah. So in New York, most of the real estate, in, in at least in Manhattan, is our co-ops. So this is a co-op. And so when you're buying a co-op, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of rules and restrictions around what you can do with the property. One of those being the ability to actually lease them out to a tenant. It's not conducive for doing that. I sold the property and bought a new one. It would have been awesome to be able to keep that 
initial property. I'd still own it to, to this day. It would have appreciated even further and it would have rented out very nicely. But unfortunately, I was unable to do that. From there, you bought that second property and that went well. And you bought the property in Connecticut for your own pleasure, but turned out it to be a rental property and a great rental property. And yeah, I can see how you would learn a tremendous amount about property management through that. You ended up though, eventually, you said that your wife got this opportunity out of the blue. Tell us a little bit about that opportunity and how it was you were able to actually just pick up and move from New York to Florida to pursue that opportunity. Yeah, fast forwarding a few years, I ended up selling the second property and I bought another property with my wife. We bought a duplex this time in Brooklyn. So one of the units we were renting out and the other unit we lived in. And my wife was approached completely out of the blue for a great opportunity in Miami. So we decided to move. And the way that we were able to do that was number one, it was a good paying job for her. But number two, we had passive income coming in because we we had invested in the musical Hamilton. So that was doing very well. We had some money coming in from that. We also were able to rent out the duplex in Brooklyn that we had. Now, when we lived there, the other unit, the second unit, which was the, I would say, less desirable unit, they're almost comparable, but our unit had the access to the backyard. And we also did some nice finishes to it when we moved in. We redid the flooring. We did some stuff to it that we honestly probably wouldn't have done if we were ever thinking we were going to rent it. So it actually is very nice for a rental type property. We thought we were going to be living there. So we were able to rent that out at at even more than the other unit, which was paying for more than half of the mortgage. So we had some nice cash flow. So we had cash flow coming from the apartment, cash flow from the real estate. I was hoping that maybe one day I'd get the the rental of place up in Connecticut to to be positive cash flow. It never was. It was always like breaking even, which is fine. But and and my wife had a good salary. So that's how we moved down to Miami. Truth be told, my initial intention was to get a job at an advertising agency down in Miami, but it became clear in the first couple of months that I was down there that the, the agencies down there just weren't of the same scale um, and size. And so the roles were smaller and, and not what I was accustomed to, number one. Number two, I was just burned out of agency life, having done it for 18 years, working crazy hours. We had our, we had already had our first child. She was a little over one years old. And I wanted to be able to spend time with my family working in the advertising agency in the world that I did. We worked very long hours, very hard hours. And sometimes if we were pitching new business, which I was always very involved in, we had all nighters and maybe several long night, uh, long out days. It's just, it was a lot of work. I wanted to be able to spend time with my family. And I really liked the real estate thing and decided to give it a shot. And so I mean, there was a whole thing with me going through and figuring out, did I want to do it? Was I not going to do it? I was listening to a lot of the Hamilton soundtrack at the time because we were investors in it and we loved the show. And I just kept hearing this song, take your shot, don't throw away your shot. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a shot and see if I can do this real estate thing full time. Tell us about taking that shot. How did you go from being an owner of a duplex and a vacation rental to getting into syndication? Yeah, I did a few other things in real estate when I started doing it full time. I was fixing and flipping some properties, but I was really looking for a way to scale up my business. I had always wanted to ever since I bought the the, the duplex in Brooklyn, which was not an inexpensive venture, by the way. My first passive investment as a real estate investor on the multifamily side was a 77 unit in New Mexico that cost less than the two unit in Brooklyn. So just to put things uh, in perspective. So for me, I I wanted to do bigger. I wanted to scale it up, but I didn't really know how. I thought I was going to need to have, have you ever seen the movie Brewster's Millions where, you know, the guy wakes up and, his he has like a distant relative that died and left him millions of dollars short of short of something like that happening to me i didn't know how i would be able to purchase a 10 million dollar property while i was doing this full time and doing the fixing and flipping and learning more and studying more i found out about syndication and it was like a light bulb went off in my head wow here's a way that i could go and work with other investors and we can pool our source, our capital together and, and other resources together and, and achieve these un- otherwise unattainable assets. So I was like, wow, this is, this can be really powerful. At the same time, a lot of my friends, I would talk to them, my friends back in New York, and they would see me doing real estate or they'd know I do this flip or whatever. And I would do 
pretty well on a flip. And they would say, hey, I'd love to invest in one of your deals. But those flips and things were just, they were too small. It it didn't really make sense to bring in another partner. And so for me, I was like, oh, these people like me. They they know me personally or or they're business colleagues and they're trusting me because they knew I'd been in real estate for 10 years before as a hobby. They had seen this has been something I've been doing and I had been passionate about. And so I thought, hey, this is a great opportunity for me to allow them to invest alongside me on deals. And I started off investing passively, just myself in other people who are syndicating deals. And I still do that to this day, by the way, 75% of my portfolio are deals that I'm invested in passively. And then the other 25% of my portfolio are deals that I am going out and and finding and, and running, right, as a sponsor. And I have partners on my deals too, but we'll go ahead and, and we'll work on those together. I, and I tell people about them. I put my own money in my own deals, but other people that are friends or in my investors, I have an investors club. So people can qualify to be in that club. And if they do, then I let them know when I have a deal and then they can invest with me in the the opportunities. So it just grew organically over time. It took me a couple of years to find my first big syndication deal, but that was a 132 unit deal, $10 million purchase price. And so we bought that. We held on to it for a few years. We sold it and we did better than we had projected that we would do. And so everyone was happy and I've done a few more since and they just keep uh, doing more and more of them. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As an industry leading relationship focused design built construction firm, Mosaic Construction has worked in many different asset classes from multifamily to retail, medical, industrial, and commercial. Mosaic Construction works to execute interior and exterior renovations with their team of trades and project managers. Their experience with value-add improvements has resulted in increased ROI and long-term value of the assets. They work nationally in partnership with local trades to deliver thoughtful, problem-solving construction management solutions to all their clients. For a personal no-obligation consultation, call Ira Singer, 773-491-3145, or email Ira at mosaicconstruction.net. You can also find Ira on LinkedIn. So you continue to do both passive and active investing. Why have you decided that dual path is for you rather than just one or the other? Yeah, for me, I put together a plan for myself while we were in Miami. And what I did was I looked at where I was financially, what was my passive income? Remember at the first, first I had the Hamilton thing and the the duplex in Brooklyn. Hamilton, we didn't know how well it would do or how long it would run for. We still don't know the answer to that. We'll know whenever it ends, that's when it ends, but it did better than we had anticipated, (laughs) which has been a wonderful thing to have. I figured out, okay, here's how much passive income I actually want per month. And I, I'm a spreadsheet guy. I'm a project manager. I'm just like a nerdy Excel spreadsheet guy. So I went into Excel and I created it and I have this thing and I use it to this day. I call it my investment tracker because it, it actually has a plan and, and then it also tracks how the investments are doing. So that can see what, what, how things are performing. But I mapped out the gap between where I was and where I wanted to be and what I needed to do to bridge that gap. And so that requires me to deploy a certain amount of capital every year at certain rate of return. Now, I can't make my investments that I'm going to do and bring to other investors be contingent upon some passive income goal that I have in mind. I'll have to do a deal this year. I can't make it based on that. So I can either invest in my own deals, which I do, but I can also, and I do, consistently invest in other people's deals. So, it, And the reason is it, it helps me, number one, achieve those passive income goals. That's number one. Number two, at the beginning and and still to this day, I can learn things from watching how other owner operators are doing their business. I can learn from that. They might have some new technology that they know or some new trick that I didn't know that I'll learn from having invested in their property. The other thing is I can't be an expert in every market in the United States, syndicators tend to focus on one or maybe multiple, but, but certain markets. So I can't be an expert everywhere. So if I can invest my money with somebody that I know, that I like, that I now trust, someone I've gotten to know, and they're in a specific market, 
and they know that market and they have good contacts and it's a networking business. It's a relationship business. They have the relationships they get. I get deals now through my own contacts that are not available to the general public just because people know me. Maybe there's a deal that needs to get done very quickly. They know I can transact on it. They know uh, I can close because not a lot of people can close on a 10, $20 million property. They know I can do that. They know I know that market. I have other properties in that market. So I'm a known quantity. And so the same thing, there's, I'm not the only guy who's like that. There's a lot of people out there. So someone might be very well known in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and they may get an uh, inside scoop on a really great opportunity there. And then and I know that person and I've maybe invested with them in the past. And maybe I check my investment tracker and see, oh, their deals in the past have done really well. Go ahead and invest with them in that deal. It gives me exposure to different markets that I don't know access to deals that I might not have those relationships. So those are some of the reasons why I would invest passively in deals. And then actively, I invest in my own deals because they're my own deals. And I think I'm pretty good with the real estate thing, quite honestly. I've done very well for myself and for a lot of my investors. And it's something I enjoy doing. So that's why I do it actively. Thank you for explaining that to us. That makes uh, a lot of sense. And I can understand how you don't want to confuse your needs from a passive investor with that active side, which involves a whole lot of other people's money that you're responsible for. You mentioned earlier that you have written or that you are in the process of writing a book that is to be published in a short a period of time. So if you would, please tell us about the book and uh, when is it projected to come out? Yeah, thanks. The, the book will come out. We're looking at a target launch right now of early fall of 2021. There's a lot of steps that need to be done. The, the book is essentially written, but we do, were in editing and then got to do the cover. We have to come up with the title, which we've got a couple of candidates, but we haven't finalized exactly what the title is yet. And, but the book is about my personal journey in real estate. And throughout the book, we go through actually quite very similar to the conversation you and I just had just in more detail and going through all those different phases of my life. And in each chapter, pulling out certain, what I call keystone concepts that I learned throughout the journey. And those keystone concepts are things that people will be able to use, I think, I hope, a passive investors will be able to take these keystone concepts. And also at the end of each chapter, I do bullet points of all the different things that I learned. And through telling the narrative, it, it does teach a lot, but hopefully in a really like user-friendly way and easily digestible way. It's not one of these real estate books that's going to be overly technical, that is really dense and, and hard to wrap your head around. This is really a book for someone who's never done anything in real estate before could read it because that's where we start off with me not really be, being an absolute novice at this. And then by the end of the book, I'm doing, I'm selling air rights. I'm doing a 1031 exchange. I'm doing bonus depreciation off cost segregation and value adds and all this other kind of stuff. So that's things that are more advanced for someone who maybe has some experience with real estate. So the book goes through a progression just like I did. And I think different people will be able to read the book and, and come in where they're where they are at their level. But if they are more advanced, let's say, than some of the earlier chapters, I still think they'll find the earlier chapters interesting because it does tell a, a unique narrative. I don't know any other former actors who then got involved in the advertising world who then got involved in multifamily syndication. Maybe there are some out there, but I don't know any. So I have some unique stories that I tell and hopefully I've infused some of my personality and maybe a little bit of humor in the book. I think that'll make it an enjoyable read. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Would you ever invest all your money in a single stock? Very unlikely. Yet investors are willing to risk $50,000 to $100,000 in a single property in real estate all the time. Investor is the world's first customizable real estate investment platform. Investors can build their own custom portfolio selecting investments across multiple asset classes such as single family homes, multifamily, student housing, self storage, and shopping centers. You can also invest across multiple markets and different time frames. Avestra also enables other real estate entrepreneurs and syndicators to build and use Avestra's infrastructure and cloud platform to create their own customizable real estate funds. To learn more, visit us at avestrainc.com. Avestra, real estate investing made simple. 
It does sound enjoyable. We'll let you know when Matt's book comes out so that you can get a copy. But yeah, you are not the only one from the arts in this business. I have interviewed other actors and musicians, opera singers, and other artsy people. I enjoy that because that's the world I come from. There are not that many of us in this business, but we do have a presence. (laughs) Before we move into the second section, tell our enlightened investors how they can get in touch with you. Oh, yeah. You could go to my website. It's mjpg.com. Or you can just email me directly, Matt, M-A-T-T, at mjpg.com. That's my website. You can sign up for the Investors Club or just sign up for the newsletter. I send out this monthly newsletter that I think people will find informative. And we'll also send out updates about important things like when the book comes out, there'll be information about the book launch and all that. We're going to give away some free books. So if you're interested in the book and you want to get a free copy, sign up for the newsletter so you can hear about it when that comes out. Matt, share with us one of your most difficult setbacks in life and how did you come through that and what did you learn from it? Yeah, I think the most difficult issue that I had, especially as it pertains to real estate, had to do with a flip that I was doing. I did a, I did a flip in, in Ohio that just went horribly off the rails. And I, it really came down to the fact that we were unable to do due diligence on the property. It was in a online sort of auction type of scenario. And you, you just had to just bid up. And Unfortunately, I had done a few of them that way and they had turned out fine. And we actually, they were quite profitable. This one, we opened up a wall and there was mold throughout the whole, we had to do a whole mold remediation. It was just one problem after another with the pipes and the electric and everything. That was hard. It didn't put me in a situation where I was destitute or anything by, by any stretch of the imagination. I, my heart goes out for people. I think there, there's people who have much more cha- much more significant challenges in life. But that it was definitely difficult for me to, to deal with, to overcome and then put money into there and sell it and, and lose money. And yeah, you know, it was a humbling experience. Again, I, I through I think through persistence, I've learned to just, I don't know, maybe it's not persistence. Maybe it's from when I learned how to ride a bicycle. Like you fall down, you get back up. So that's what I did. And I've had other challenges in business in the past, but that was a real significant, like felt it in, in my, in my wallet type of uh, experience. That was, it was difficult to get through, sucked it up, spent the money that we needed to, to get the, the place done, sold it up at a loss, tried to keep a smile on my face while we did it and moved on to the next thing. And I think that's the most important thing that you can, the, the lesson that you can learn is there are going to be failures and or setbacks. And it's really about understanding that happens. That's part of life. That's a teachable moment. For me, that was the last flip I did because what I realized was that market Not that market, but I'm just talking about flips in general at that time and and have continued, I believe, to this day to be such a competitive market because everyone thinks that they can do it, that the only way to really get uh, deals at a reasonable price is to take unnecessary risk. It is, I guess it's necessary to get the the deal, but that that sort of risk can, can really put you in a bad spot. And so that's why it's taught me to be very conservative with my underwriting and my approach in real estate is very conservative because of that. I just don't, I'm not chasing deals. I need to be able to do a thorough due diligence and make sure that I really understand the property. Anytime that I've slowed down on the due diligence and haven't been as thorough with it always becomes a problem. So it's always a very big, important part of the process. It sounds to me like there were several lessons you learned, I I think. (laughs) One of the lessons is that price is not necessarily the ultimate deciding factor when purchasing real estate. And the other lesson is that due diligence is absolutely critical to any real estate project. Any other lessons you might have learned from that? No, I would agree. I was focused mainly on that second one, but I think you make a very good point with the first. Price is not the only factor, right? Yeah. Matt, what are you most grateful for in your life today? Well, I have an amazing wife and two wonderful children. So that's what I'm most grateful for. They are they are my why. And so that's why I do everything. And this whole pandemic thing that we've been faced with has been difficult, but it's also given us a lot of opportunity, whether we wanted it or not, to to to, to hang out and bond. And we did beforehand. It's not like we never saw each other or anything. My kids are too young to do anything on their own. They're very young. But it's, yeah, that's what I'm most grateful for is both of them. The three of them are healthy 
And that's what's most important to me. Tell us about uh, three good things that have happened to you in the last 24 hours. That's good. You're catching me off guard. In the last 24 hours, let's see. I had a wonderful meeting just before this with the bank because I used to use, I don't want to promote particular banks. I used to use a certain bank uh, for many years. And then when we moved to Massachusetts, they didn't exist here. So I switched over to another bank, which I was a little trepidatious about. And about a year later, the old bank opened up here, but to switch all the accounts back over was a big, was going to be a big hassle. But some things have happened with the newer bank that I'm with, just fees, these guys, and they couldn't do what needed to be done, which could be very easy. So I just met with a new banker at the old bank that is now here in Massachusetts as well. And that was a very positive, great thing other great things that have happened in the past 24 hours had some wonderful calls with with some potential investors the other thing i did is so i'm along with the book and everything i've decided to rebrand my company so that mjppg.com is probably going to change i think i know what it's going to change to but it'll redirect so go to mjppg.com We'll go to the new one when we launch it in a few months. But I'm going through this sort of branding exercise and trying to dive deep into sort of who I am and find out what are the key sort of building blocks of my brand and who am I and what am I about? And, and I've been able to do a lot of introspection on that, but uh, I'm reading a book that talks about all of this. And one of the things that said in the book is to reach out to your customers and find out what they say that there's a Jeff Bezos quote that I'm going to get wrong, but it's something along the lines of your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room, something to that effect. And so I sent out an email early this morning asking people, only the people who've invested in my deals, not my whole newsletter list, but just the people who've invested with me before. How do I show up to you? What are some adjectives? I said, I don't need a long sentence. I'm not publishing this information. It's not going to be posted anywhere. But just what are some adjectives you would use to describe me and or my business? And it's really not. It was really not that I was expecting it to be like an ego boost, but I they're actually very nice things that, that have been said. But also the, the great thing is I'm seeing a lot of people using a lot of that same word, right? There's a few words that are, that a lot of them keep using that word. And some of those, those words were the words that I had on my list. So I'm working with all of that to come up with what are really the building blocks of the four or five defining things that make my brand what it is. And I kind of know what it is. And I always had a North Star, but I never had the full like mission statement, like the full nine yards. So that's what I'm working on. And that was a really positive thing that's happened today to, to start reading what People think about me and, and the business and the way that I conduct business has been as very it's nice. Yeah. So that's two things. You have a third good thing. I thought that was three because it was the bank. bank. It was the thing about the people, but it was also, I thought it was the, the thing about just having good conversations with potential new investors. Bank. I had a couple other calls this morning that were very positive with people who are interested in joining the Investors Club. So yeah, okay. those were good. Very good things there. So how I also are... watched Rent last night. There was the 25th anniversary of Rent was broadcast uh -huh. live last night. And that was really cool. My wife and I didn't know each other at the time, but we were both big fans. It's actually referred to in my book because uh -huh. it was the impotence for me owning real estate. Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. the musical Rent. So I watched that last night. Sorry, that's a fourth thing. I just had to mention it because it was awesome. I didn't know there was a live performance being broadcast last night. Where was it being produced? There's a thing called the uh, Manhattan Theater Workshop. Or sorry, I think it's a, the Musical Theater Workshop. And it's where a lot of shows get started. Rent started there. It's a small thing in the East Village. Also, Hades Town, which was recently on Broadway, originated there. The musical Once originated there. It's a place where they do a lot of new work and then it moves. And so it was a benefit for, for the musical theater workshop. And it was and it's the 25th anniversary of Rent. So all of the people from Rent were there. We're like talking and not only just the original cast, but all the subsequent cast and the directors. And they, they told the whole story of it, how it started and then all the way through Broadway. And so it was really great. But Phenomenal performances, actually. It was really cool. It sounds fantastic. I watched the Oprah Winfrey interview with the cast of Billie Holiday versus the oh. United States government. It was a wonderful interview. Well, I'd like to see that. 
Yeah, yeah, it was great. Have you seen the Billie Holiday? I it's, haven't, but she just won. I saw the the uh, Golden Globe, right? Yeah, so she deserves it. it. It really is a great production. It's just on Hulu, but it is worth watching. I didn't know half of what Billie Holiday went through. What a phenomenal life and what a hard life. But mm. boy, it was interesting. So how do you put your uh, success as uh, an investor and entrepreneur to work to create a uh, universal well-being? and abundance for all beings. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because it's something that's really important to me. It's one of those brand values that I was talking about. I try to make everything that I do from a real estate investment a win-win. So we really try to elevate and revitalize these multifamily communities. We we invest in them and we uh, restore services or, or elevate services where I know some landlords are, they reduce services. People call those slumlords, right? So w- we look to to really make a, a, a positive impact and um, not curing cancer and, and I'm not saving the world and I'm not a charity, right? So we are in this, we do have a profit motive. And we make good money, but I feel that there's a way to make money ethically and by making things better. And so I, that's what I try to do. I try to make the world a little bit of a better place. And one of the other things that I do with my company is we donate time and money to a, a local nonprofit here in Boston. It's called Caritas Communities. And they're in the greater Boston area. And they are working to end homelessness in the area. And it's not like a homeless shelter. They actually provide permanent housing for people a lot of veterans, people who may have had substance abuse issues, women who maybe were in abusive situations that from many, from various different obstacles or challenges that they have in their lives. And it provides permanent housing, long-term housing, and also helps them with job placements and things of that nature to really create, to prevent homelessness. And so it's something that I'm very passionate about. I love that fact that it's local here in Boston. And I love the fact that it's real estate related, which is what I do. So it has that nice tie-in. It's a wonderful organization. Those are the ways that I try to get back. And then I'm involved in other charitable giving opportunities, especially during COVID. We donated to the CDC Foundation. We do a lot of donations with Broadway Cares and things of that nature. Yeah, that's how I get back. I live in Boston. I, yeah, just outside of Boston. If people know Boston, I'll say I live in Brookline. If you don't know Boston, then I live in Boston. It's, it's adjacent to Boston, surrounded actually by three sides with Boston. Brookline kind of just chucked in there. Yeah. Boston is definitely one of my favorite cities in the United States. A fascinating history, a beautiful place to visit. My last question, Matt, is when you leave this world, what do you want as your epitaph? Wow. That's pretty heavy. I don't know if I've ever given that much thought. I will say that I, as I just alluded to in the last thing, that I try to make the world a better place. I, I actually even say something about that to the to that effect in my book, where I try to, I'm trying to leave the world a better place, and hopefully this book has left you in a better place to, with your investment decisions and things like that. So I think it would, I, I don't know the exact wording, but I think it would want to be something along those lines of he made the world... And again, I'm not curing cancer, but he made the world a little better than how he found it, I think would be something in that vein. Hopefully I can raise uh, two girls who end up being nice members of society. That will be a big contribution, I would hope. And yeah, that's that. just, he was a nice guy and tried to help people and, and make things better. I hope you have a long life and it's a long time before that epitaph. <laughs> Thank you, me too. Thank you so much, Matt, for being on the show. Thank you for sharing your life's journey and for sharing your wisdom as a real estate investor. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure for me too. Thanks for having me on your show. I do appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance brought to you by Steve Talker Capital a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at stevetalker.com.